Welcome to The Rock. We hope what you watch today inspires you. And we'd love to hear your questions and comments via Twitter at The Rock of York. You can also find us on Facebook or contact us through the website at www.rockofyork.co.uk. In the meantime, let's crack on. Getting old has its rewards and, and its curses. I never used to ache, ever. <laughs> And you get up on the morning and think, oh, wow, I don't know why I'm aching. <laughs> However, you do get to have grandkids, which is brilliant. That's, if you haven't tried that yet, it's, uh, it's fabulous. As one person said, if I'd known how good this was, I'd have had the grandkids first. <laughs> but you don't have the same energy, so when you've got very hands-on, like with Riley, I've realized it can be a bit... Uh, bit draining at times. The other thing that, that also is notable is uh, you, you leave the naivety of youth behind and that can be difficult because uh, knowledge is not, can be helpful but it's not always pleasurable because you see much more than you ever did and know much more than you ever did but on the other hand because you've learned it becomes a responsibility of, uh, of those who've got some years on the back to pass on that that understanding, and uh, it also is beholden of those who are a bit younger to be humble enough to appreciate that uh, there's things you can learn because people have been there before, done it before. So I want to talk to you tonight about a very important um, subject. I want to talk to you about the identity crisis that all of us encounter, whether we realize it or not. Sometimes we just don't know what are the terminologies that we need to use for the things that we are facing, but identity crisis is something that, that we all face and all go through, and maybe not just one time. You know, the, I don't know if you've ever heard the term midlife crisis is another time at which, um, when that happens, you begin to look at your whole purpose in life. You're, what the heck is it all about, you know? And um, you either become positioned to, to leave a legacy and, and to have an impact, or you slip into a kind of depression and status quo because you think, woe is me, what a failure, what was my life all about? And you just kind of do everything the same, just kind of waiting to die, which again is not, is not helpful. So th there's a, I don't know if you've seen the program on TV, Who Do You Think You Are? I find them fascinating and uh, a lot of very interesting people on there. Um, some of them I appreciate, some of you are not quite as old as us, won't, won't have any recollection of people like Una Stubbs, um, who was actually from York, and um, uh, uh, what's interesting about it is how you begin to see how people can begin to piece together some of the things that they are now because they get an understanding of of where their genetics have come from. That's why I've told you it was one of the most important things for me over the last three years was investigating and find what I've, I've shared with you about my grandfather being, being born in the workhouse in 1901 and the shame and the rejection that went along and how my name Chapman is a maternal name because my grandfather was never adopted. He was rejected because he was, I've got to use the term, in, in society's eyes, he was a bastard and not welcome, and we come from those roots, and, and you know, the grace of God is, is what has made a difference, but I realize I, I can still carry some of the legacy, uh, the unknown legacy, because in the same way that, that genetically you pass on things to your children, and they go right through your grandchildren, and you recognize that there is a genetic downflow, there is also an emotional and spiritual and psychological downflow that, um, you know, sometimes we don't realize how important that is because we only think, because we can see and touch and feel the genetics, we say, oh, he's got eyes like his dad, or, you know, when you smile, I see your grandfather. But, but why would we dismiss the fact that down through those same genetics come the emotions of the mother and the grandmother and the father and the grandfather and the great-grandfather? 
that there is the downflow of the emotional, psychological thing, because remember, your brain's part of who you are, so why would you just pass on physical things from other parts of your body, you know, like, like you get heart disease going in families, genetically. Why wouldn't there be issues of, 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 of the psyche and experiences that, that would pass down to, to the next generation? I, I, I believe that's, nest, I think that happens. And, I think we pay far too little attention and therefore for parts of our lives we are, we're trying to fix something but we don't know what it is we're trying to fix but that's the, that's the root of it. Um, so I put that question for us tonight, who do you think you are? Because the, the whole point of that program is people think they are somebody but after they've gone through the process they realise I might not be who I think I was. Uh, there's also another program that's been on recently that, that um, many of you probably won't have seen, it might not. It might not ring your bell, but uh, Chris and I really liked it, and there haven't been enough episodes, really, as far as we're concerned yet. Um, but that program was called uh, In Therapy, and uh, it's a, it's a well-known London therapist who, um, she has people who've been celebrities or children of celebrities who've had trouble in their lives come in, and she basically psychoanalyzes them, and it, that's nothing to be scared of because it's very, very interesting because all of them who've come in uh, have had issues in one way or another. The, the latest one was uh, Katie Price, who of course started out as, as, um, as Jordan. Um, and uh, it was fascinating to see this lady just unfolding the, the layers of, of Katie's life and you begin to realize why her insatiable desire for certain things like celebrity have cropped up. And another, another one who some of you again won't, won't remember, but um, a guy called Callum Best, who was the son of Georgie Best, who was one of the greatest footballers of my generation, um, uh, world renowned. Um, but Georgie, with all his fame, could have any girl he wished. He was a good looking boy. He was, you know, he was the celebrity of the, of the I guess, the late 60s into the 70s. And, uh, and yet Georgie finished up alcoholic, you know, he had liver transplant because of his alcoholism and basically died in his 50s, miserable, uh, unhappy, and yet the world was at his feet, literally, not just the football, but the world was at his feet. And so you begin to realize there are things that go on in people's lives that you can't fix by fame, fortune, adoration, uh, whatever, and uh, that, you know, the so-called celebrity, those people are just like you and I. It's just that the, the scale at which they have f tried to find ways to deal with their issues are larger than ours, and so we all get to watch them on TV. Well, I don't anyway, because it drives me nuts, but, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm old school now. You used to be a celebrity because you did something to celebrate, uh, you know, not just because you got your backside out or something, and, you know, it's like, anyway. <laughs> or had sex on TV, whatever the thing may be these days. Um, the reason I wanted to raise this is because I believe that everything, everything changes in the life of a person when they truly believe they are who God says they are. And I don't mean that as a cliche because I'm a pastor and we're in church. Um, I really do believe, in my view, you've got to be crazy not to embrace the concept of the divine. Uh, you know, you'll never see a bridge or a building that didn't have an architect. You'll never see a, a painting or a sculpture that, that didn't have an artist. You know, you just, it's just not going to happen. And you never see a great invention that didn't have an inventor. So, you know, for me, the, the, there is a basic flaw in the concept of trying to say, there is no God, there can be no God, let's rule God out. To me, it's like, well, that, it doesn't make any sense. It's not... It's neither science nor rational. Um, so I absolutely do believe in the context of that, that, that the God who I believe is best represented through Jesus uh, has, a, has a view about who he wants me to be. Now, he can't control me being that, but he sure as heck is going to put everything at his disposal available to allow me to become that, and he'll still love me if I don't become that, but I might not love me. And uh, where God's love never changes, ours does. 
Because he will love us whether we hit the mark or don't hit the mark. But the truth is, the likely it is in life, you won't. You won't keep loving yourself. You won't cure that lack of love for yourself. And you could grow to be an older person with a greater and greater sense of self-loathing, a greater and greater sense of, I'm a failure. Uh, think what I could have done if only. And uh, I understand those feelings. And, and unless they are dealt with, unless we get to the root of them, uh, it's so easy for, for, for most of us, if not all of us, to finish up in that place. But I, as I said, believe that everything changes in the life of a person when they truly believe they are who God says they are. Um, I wish I could say to you, I'm right there, and so I am totally content, but I'm not. I'm still on a journey with that. Um, one of the problems of being honest about your own life is that most people are not looking for leaders who are honest about their own life. They want people who, who self-promote themselves and flatter everybody else. You know, if you do this, you can be like me. Um, when actually most of us as human beings are somewhat broken behind the scenes and past the suits and the, the nice clothes and the holidays and the cars. And uh, really that's what all this is about. So who, who I think I am and who God says I am can be two wildly different people. Uh, and sometimes we try to marry the two because we're trying to promote our agenda and hope therefore that who I think I am is who God thinks I am. Now, that's fine if you are at the moment in a positive vein where you're thinking, I'm just amazing, God thinks I'm amazing, but uh, an awful lot of people don't think they're amazing. You know, I'm, I'm not that concerned about, about well, that, and that can, that can be healed. Right, okay, well, let me help you. I, I know that, and we're going we're gonna to help you to deal with that tonight as we go along. Because there's an awful lot of people who, you know, I've often said, I, I don't want to know you in the sense of I can see you, meet you here, talk to you here, but, but what's going on up here when you go to bed tonight? What, what happens when there's nobody to impress and, and nobody to play the game in front of? Who are you then? What, what goes on there? How confident are you then? How, how much of that, oh, this is me, is reality when you get to that place? See, true identity is one of the most difficult struggles of humanity. And uh, I'm happy for you to embrace that. I, I feel, not everybody might feel this, but I feel that I have grown up in a culture in church where where um, the struggles of true identity were not really brought into the open. Um, I could tell you tale after tale. I, I know the successful people who smile in church but are addicted to pornography in a way that's absolutely destroying them and their marriage and their life, but you'd never know it. You know, I know people who, on one hand, are looking like they're a success when actually with all the right words, but when you, when you meet them in person, look into their life, they are trying to mask the disaster that is the choices that they have made. And, and yeah, I, I'd, I'd like to hope that we could build a place where what you see is what you get. And I think we've gone some ways to doing that. I think the problem with that is that most people are wanting to come to church for an escape, not, a, not to face reality. And it's far easier to build a church where you can just escape the realities of life for a few moments. Well, to me, that's no different to, to getting drunk or taking drugs. You know, it, it, it's, it's a mood-changing mood substance. And I, I do believe our mood should be changed. And I do believe that our mood should be lifted. But, but if that's the reason we're in this, then the truth is we're not being real and we're not being truthful and we're playing a game. And I don't want you to have that game. I want you to find the joy that passes all that that flows into the difficulties of life because true identity is absolutely one of the most difficult struggles of humanity. And whenever, whenever that identity that we're looking for is rooted in or confused with acceptance, there will be a distortion and a prostituting of the true self on that altar. Let me, let me explain. Most of us don't realize it probably, but actually at the core of what we're trying to do, particularly in a, 
in a group level is we're looking for acceptance. I'm the same. I, I, I want to be liked. I don't want grief. I want to be liked. I want everybody to like everything that I said and think it was absolutely amazing and tell me so because I'm human. We want people to like us. We want to be liked. However, the problem is that, that when our identity is rooted or confused in, in the need to get acceptance, we're always going to come out with a distorted understanding and a distorted personality and character. And we actually will prostitute ourselves on that altar. So, so, so there are some of you in here today. I don't know how many. You know, I'm not even going to guess. But you're prostituting your true self on the altar of acceptance. What I mean by that is you are being something or being somebody or saying something or going somewhere or doing something so that you will be accepted within the group. So that those who you kind of look up to, whether you should or shouldn't, will think you're okay. And we've all done it. I've done it. I've done it as a preacher. I remember as a young preacher traveling in America. uh, And you realize, looking back, you're trying to imitate those who you respected. And why were you trying to imitate them? Not because you thought that what they were doing was amazing, but you realized that you would be accepted if you were like them because you believed that they were accepted. So if I do the same thing, I'll be accepted. And you prostitute yourself on that altar which is not a good thing to do. And so we don't resolve the problem, we make the problem worse. And, and there comes a point where that hits you in the face like a brick that some of you haven't got there yet because you're too young. But the brick is coming. As, as one of my favorite comedians said, somebody said they threw a brick, and then it hit me. Uh, so, a, a little phrase here that I thought was really good. Um, I won't tell you where it was from, it doesn't matter tonight, but one's own ambition and insecurity are often the most insidious enemy. One's own ambition and insecurity are often the most insidious enemy. You see, often our ambition is driven by the fact that we don't really know who we are, and so we're trying to become that, and so we hope that through ambition and achievement, We will find who that person is that we are looking for. And of course, that's mostly driven by insecurity. See, most of the real mouthy people that you meet, I mean, the people who are really full of themselves and mouthy, are actually very insecure people. And they cover their insecurity by being overbearing, by by pushing out, by if, if, if I can, if I can. If I can dominate the conversation, if I can be the dominant personality, then I don't have to look at myself and I don't have to answer awkward questions and nobody's going to come back. In fact, people will imitate me because they want to be accepted by me, but most of them are actually insecure. So for all of us, ambition on the one hand and insecurity on the other hand are insidious enemies. I am less and less concerned about a devil as in a person, fallen angels, who obviously wouldn't have horns anyway, but you've been drawn that way. Uh, I, I am less worried about that and the context of that and the concept of that from history um, than I am by what the Hebrew word used, a, a Satan. They talked about a Satan, not the Satan, a Satan. And Satan was an adversary. And the whole concept of devil was never meant to be so much about there is this person who's after you, who's got horns and whatever. And that's not our conversation tonight. The most important point in the Hebrew mind was was when you have an adversary, somebody who is trying to come against you to destroy you. Now, I believe adversarially that doesn't have to be some person called the devil or some creatures called the demons because I would propose to you you're more capable of being a devil to yourself than they could ever wreak mischief against you so when ambition is trying to cover the problem and when insecurity comes from the problem actually there is our devil right there there's 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 our adversary there's where we need to be delivered from and where we need to have answers to so let me say this which which might shock some of you, but a measure of rebellion is healthy. It really is. You see, unquestioning submission and compliance do not contribute to a healthy life or a healthy society. 
And um, there needs to be some rebellion in church life. Because the problem is we can, we can get so bound into unquestioning submissions and compliance that it stops us being healthy as a people, as individuals, because we have to question things. We have to stop and say, what's the purpose of this? Why this? Does this really matter? If it matters, how much does it matter? And why does it matter? And does it matter to me? So, so the problem is, throughout history, religion has been used as a tool to stop people questioning, to bring them into submission. You don't ask why, you just do as you're told, and that is not healthy. Now, it has its place, but it's not healthy. I think a little bit of rebellion in kids is really healthy. Kids who are too submissive because they are afraid of the consequences are only doing what they're doing out of fear and not out of love. So what they're doing is compliance and not obedience. And you need to see a little mischief, a little rebellion in there, so that they're shaking free of what would be to them just unquestioning compliance, so that they find their character, they find who they are. Now, now of course, that shouldn't be taken to the extreme, because rebellion on its own builds absolutely nothing. Rebellion on its own, all it ever does is tear down, oppose, argue against, and that builds nothing. But a little bit of rebellion is good. Do you know all the Jewish leaders thought Jesus was a rebel? Why? Because he wouldn't have unquestioning submission and compliance to the model that they had now developed that they called Judaism. He questioned it and opposed it, and therefore there was a rebellion, a good kind of rebellion that says what, why, when, how, where. And so it's good. So, there's a story in the Bible. Well, the story is the wrong. There's an account in the Bible would be a more accurate way to say it. And it's about Jesus and it's about him when he's beginning his ministry going out into the, the desert, into the wilderness, into the barren place where it says for, he, he, he didn't eat for 40 days and 40 nights and, and at the end of it, it says he was tempted by the devil. He was tempted by the adversary. He was tempted by a Satan. Um, I've already talked about that and said I wonder sometimes whether the devil we face in the wilderness places of our lives is not actually the horned character that you know, we talk about from the depths, but it's actually ourselves. It's the time that we actually have the argument with ourselves. The adversarial side of us that is conflicting with who we really are and who we ought to be. And so, in, in this story, of course, it says, it says the devil tempted him. So, it's an adversarial challenge in, in this biblical account of Jesus encountered in the desert. And it consisted of three temptations... And uh, I believe the three temptations are very symbolic um, because all of them were related to Jesus' identity, okay? So, so that, that challenge is all about identity. So, so for Jesus to be who he should be because that's who God had made him to be and that was the real person, he had to overcome the challenges that were coming against his identity. He had to secure who he really was. Who do you think you are, Jesus, was really at the root of the question. And, uh, of course, in being related to his identity, that means that we're also by default related to his confidence and security, because our confidence and our security is connected to our identity. And if you don't resolve the identity issue, you won't resolve the confidence and security issue. Um, I've watched that Riley at the moment because now he's five and uh, he's, his level of naivety is, is bleeding away as it does from, you know, as children get older, the level of naivety bleeds away. Uh, and I'm, I'm shocked because I see him copying habits and things that I had as a kid because I know what's going on in him. His confidence and his security are now being shaken. You're in school, you're with all these different kids, you face the challenges of education. And now he's a little less confident and he's a little less secure than he used to be. But it all down to his identity. Am I, am I capable? Am I able? Can I make it? Can I handle this? And those questions are going on already in his five-year-old brain. And that's what's happening to us. So identity, confidence, and security are all inseparably connected. And at the core of these temptations that Jesus faced, which I'm going to talk about 
uh, specifically in just a moment. There is a driving pressure to pull you away from who God says you are. So all the pressures that come from that adversarial challenge that is related to your identity are trying to pull you away from who God says you are. Every temptation in your life, I could say, has one root at the core, which is to pull you away from who God says you are. So whether it's a temptation to sleep in, sleep around, you know, be in education, flunk education, uh, you know, to, to get blind drunk or, you know, whatever, they're all related to trying to, trying to, to pull you away from who God says that, that you are. There's this battle going on on the inside. Let, let me explain a little bit from these things. It's in Luke chapter 4, you'll find the scripture. I'm not going to read it all, but I'll just, I'll read the three temptations. Luke 4 verse 3, the devil said to him, the adversary said to him, if, and this is the thing, if you are the son of God, if you are who you think you are, tell these stones to become bread. Now you're familiar with that story, most of you, it's one of the common and known parts of the Bible. What, what's it about? Well, Jesus is hungry. He's wrestling with who he is. Let's make no bones about that. Jesus in the wilderness is wrestling with who he is. I am one of these strange people who believe he wasn't totally sure who he was, but he was by the time he left the desert, but only when he went to be baptized and he heard a voice from heaven say, you're my son, I love you. And I'm well pleased with you. And from that point on, that's when Jesus began to do amazing, miraculous things as Jesus, because he now knew who he was, and he'd resolved the question that he had now walked for 30 years trying to address. So if Jesus, and I personally believe he was, was wrestling for those 30 years to come to the conclusion on his identity and who he really was, hey, chill. It's okay, okay? But that first temptation, if... And that's the big thing we ask about ourselves. If you're so good, if you think you're so capable, if you think you know so much, if you think you're this, if you think you're that, those questions come to us, you know. If you think you're a good husband, if you think you're a good wife, if, 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 if. And it's all based on this. And he said, tell these stones to become bread, which if you're hungry is quite a temptation, but... but let me, let me tell you what I believe that was about. It was suggesting that being able to meet your physical needs is the primary proof that you're living your true identity. If you are who you say you are, meet your physical need, which is hunger. Meet your physical need by finding somebody to love you. Meet your physical need by taking something that helps you forget. Because if you do that, that's how you prove that you're living in your true identity. I would beg to differ. And say that most of the things that we try to do to meet our physical needs are never going to resolve our identity issues. And that's why Jesus refused it, not because he wasn't hungry, but because he realized just meeting my needs as my needs stand is not going to resolve the question which is in me, which is who am I really and what am I really here for? Then he goes Luke 4 verse 7, the second one. So if you worship me, so... so the adversary says, look, uh, I have authority over, over the world, okay? I've got authority over all these people in these places. And let me, save you, let me save you a problem. If you worship me, it will all be yours. So here, here's how I want to interpret that. Worship that which you think has the power to give you what you're looking for, is what Jesus was posed with. Worship that which you think has the power to give you what you're looking for. That was the challenge. And it's still the challenge you've got. The challenge will say, why don't you just worship that which you believe has the power to give you what you're looking for. But it would never have met the expectations of Jesus or fulfilled the words of the one promising because it was never capable of doing that. And what you think things in life promise, you, they will not give you what they promise. And that's one of the things, the good lessons you do learn when you get a little bit older. There's a lot of things that promise much but deliver little. But by the time you've experienced them, you've spent the fortune of your life acquiring them, but they never give you what you think they should have given you for what you paid to get them, what you gave to experience them. 
So that second challenge was, why don't you worship that which you think is the power to give you what you're looking for? The third temptation was this. The devil led him to Jerusalem, verse 9, and had him stand in the highest point of the temple and said, if you're the son of God, again, here's the thing, if, if you are who you think you are, if you've resolved the identity thing, throw yourself down from here. Now, now, rather interestingly, this adversary, it's recorded, added another little thing, which comes from the Psalms. He said, for, for it is written, he will give his angels charge over you, lest at any time you dash your foot against the stone. Here's, here's the third one, and particularly applies to some of us who've had a, a little bit of a life in church. Do something stupid to prove who you think you are. And as some of you have already done some stupid things to try and prove who you think you are. That was the third challenge. Do something stupid. Now, of course, the issue is, stupid things never seem stupid at the time. While we're looking to resolve our identity thing, they just seem like fun. It just seemed like that would be a right laugh for me to do that. Wouldn't it be great if... And so we finish up doing some stupid things... All right, well, you sit there. You lay there. Go on, there you go. Okay, that's fine. Yeah. Okay. Right. Okay. I think you've done your job. It's wonderful, but let me tell you what. These people need to also have a listen. So you help me by letting them listen. So the challenge was do something stupid. Throw yourself off here. Uh, but, but here's the point. Do something stupid to prove who you think you are and have a Bible verse to support your actions. <laughs> and let me tell you what I've discovered in church. We always have a Bible verse to support our actions when some of those actions now I see were stupid, 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 religious, ridiculous, but it's all part of that temptation that's drawing you away from your true identity, not pushing you into it. Now, I've got to just deal with this because it's important. Jesus' answer to every three, uh, every one of these three process of temptation, these adversarial challenges to who he was, was it is written. Now, I don't think Jesus was Bible bashing this adversarial situation but I think what Jesus was saying, which I find interesting, Jesus didn't say, I say that I'm not going to listen to you. He said, it is written. Now, I think there's a point in that. And I think this is one of the greater lessons of the account of Jesus' temptation in the desert. Maybe the greatest, the need to resolve the challenge of discovering our God-given identity from outside our own predetermined thoughts and ideas. See, Jesus was answering from outside his own predetermined thoughts and ideas. The problem with some of us, we're trying to discover our identity by answering the question from within us when we're already screwed up anyway, therefore our answer can't be right because it's coming from a place that's already messed up. So Paul the Apostle said one day, if we measure ourselves against ourselves, we're not wise because we're always going to have an excuse, we're always going to have a reason why we responded in the way we responded. So when Jesus didn't say, I think this and I think that, and, it's it, and I, I'm saying this, he said, it is written, which was drawing the attention away to say, I've got an answer to this that comes from outside of my situation. Now, let me, let me detail that a bit more. He was resolving the challenge of discovering God-given identity from, from outside our own predetermined thoughts and ideas, listen, from outside our wounds and the influence that, that, that formed our negative, reactive thinking. If you only try to deal this, you are going to deal with it from your wounds and from the influences that have formed your negative reactive thinking, which was shaped by who you think you are that's come from the past, from your experiences, and from those things that were handed down to you. And it also entered outside of his own situation because it, this comes from beyond our compliance to a creed or process. We have to answer from beyond our compliance to a creed or process. Um, I was taught by someone I knew very dearly that the the thing that came up in the 60s, which was I'm trying to find who I am, was ridiculous and stupid. Now, I can understand that conclusion from someone raised in a wartime generation and all the stuff that came with that. 
But actually, you know, those, those who became flower power and hippies in the 60s were genuinely asking a sincere question because they refused to have imposed upon them who somebody said they were and were desperately realizing that this may not be who I really am. And so they were trying to address that challenge from beyond compliance and, and uh, from beyond compliance to a creed and a process. Now, I was raised very obedient to the creed and the process that we call church and Christianity and Pentecostalism. And, uh, and so I could always give you the answer that you would like to hear from me because I knew the answer that was required and I could always give the answer that was required because I knew the answer that was being looked for. So even in my struggles growing up, I knew what answer I had to give when I was asked the questions because I knew the answer to the questions. And the truth is I was never discovering who I really was. I was locked into this thing of compliance to a creed and a process. And so that became adversarial to me because you're always trying to maintain that idea and maintain that mask. So... Discovering our God-given identity from outside our own predetermined thoughts and ideas, from outside our wounds and the influences that formed our negative or reactive thinking. I, I know where to push some of your buttons because I know, I know where you've been wounded. I know for some of you, even before you ever came to this place, I know some of the experiences that you've had in relationships, in family, in life, in work, in your past, in your childhood, and I could push your buttons and what will happen, invariably, is that there will be a reactive approach to this thing, a negative reactive thing, because it's touching the buttons. But the point is, what Jesus came on the scene for was not so we would have the divine cover-up for all these things, but so we would have divine healing for all these things. And what I want to say to you tonight, there is healing, there is hope, there is life, from all those things, but it comes from discovering your identity is not locked into those experiences, but there are some steps you have to take to step free from it. So our lives are formed by so many influences, experiences, and messages. How many of you would agree? And they form what is known as our worldview. That's how each of us sees the world. Uh, and that our primary tendency... In that worldview, because our lives are formed by so many influences, experiences, and messages, is to develop coping mechanisms that alleviate the residual senses and feelings deposited in us by those life experiences. Some of you think you've dealt with stuff. I've just developed coping mechanisms. And something will happen, something will be said you will have an experience that will poke right through that coping mechanism to show you that wound is still there, that regret is still there, that disappointment is still there, that fear is still there, that self-loathing is still there because we develop coping mechanisms. Now, you're not a freak to do that. We all do it. It's the natural process that we take, but God sent Jesus to break us out of that natural process. Is that right? Okay. We like a good cold, particularly when it's cold. Now, now you need to understand this, that, that what happens there within us are complex pieces of psychological engineering, which are brilliantly constructed by the mind. Your mind is an incredible thing. And it brilliantly constructs these psychologically engineered coping mechanisms that make us feel we've resolved the problem and it's all sorted and I'm okay. Okay? I'm fine. And, and, but the problem is, what it springs up in our mind is driven more by survival, reaction, and the need for acceptance than a true self-image. So it's brilliant, your mind, at survival techniques. It's brilliant at, at, at developing reactions that steer you and people away from the issues you're trying to deal with. And, and really what happens is it's constructed out of the need for acceptance more than it is a true self-image. It's not about, can I independently, on my own, under God, find who I really am? Your mind will get it so that you're actually dependent upon acceptance and therefore you're being driven again. I've got to find the place of where I have acceptance, which is usually by performance. And the truth is it wants and desires, it, it's... The wants and desires of this process trump the restraining parameters of wholeness and peace. And as for something known as delayed gratification, forget it. 
something in, in psychology known as delayed gratification, which means that some of the objectives in life you have to realize are down the road, are down the track. And if you grab for them now, if, if, you, if you try and take them now, you're not ready for them and they're not ready for you. And so you'll do stupid stuff to get stupid things that were not the time. And delayed gratification means you realize that as you walk the process, there is all that you need for all that you need coming along the track but that's if you can break free of this thing rather than realizing that these mental issues restrain the parameters of wholeness and peace. So we're nearly there. Our perceived identity is shaped by these things which are actually in conflict with our true identity. They can, if unchecked, prevent us from ever finding the peace and contentment that comes from living true to who God made us to be. Now listen to this statement. Created things are breakable. Created things are breakable. You are a created thing. The universe is a created thing. The climate is a created thing. Every created thing is breakable. Created things are breakable. I want you to take some comfort from that. To realize creatable things are actually breakable. So don't be surprised when we find something broken in our lives or in the life of others. But this is why healing and restoration play such a big part in the ministry of Jesus. Because created things are breakable. So God sends Jesus and healing and restoration play a major part in his ministry. Why? Because created things are breakable. And that's why transformation as well which comes by the renewing of the mind, that's what the Bible teaches, is so essential in changing the course of our lives from that shaped by our experiences to that which is unfolded by the hand of God. We have a choice tonight. Be shaped by our experiences or see our lives come into the place that are being unfolded by the hand of God. I know which I want and choose, and that's what God was providing in Jesus, and why healing and restoration were such an important part of his ministry. Nearly done. A verse in Romans chapter 12 and verse 2 says, Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world. That's talking about what we've been talking about. Some people want to put words into the text that are not there because you have your favorite list of do's and don'ts, right? This is not about your favorite list of do's and don'ts, which are usually, the don'ts are usually the things that you manage not to do and the do's are usually the things that you've managed to do. So you're actually blowing your own trumpet, promoting your own self-importance because it's always only the don'ts are what other people haven't done and the do's are what you have done. And that's never the way that Jesus taught, and it's not how the gospel is. He says, don't conform any longer to the pattern of this world. The pattern of this world is the pattern that we have described that adversarially will pull you away from the true discovery of who you really are and who God has made you to be. So, it says, if you don't conform to the pattern of this world any longer, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, something has to change in the way that you think, if you are going to test and approve what God's wonderful will and purpose is. Now, I don't believe God has your life planned out for you. I believe God has a plan to walk with you through life. That's the plan, to walk with you through life, to help you to find who you were always supposed to be so that heaven's best becomes earth's reality in your life and in your position because you begin to know who you are. So if I think I am and who God says I am, and are made to be, we have to understand that may be in direct conflict with each other, who I think I am and who God says I am and I'm made to be. So the question then, as we bring this to a close, what is my responsibility in the light of this? What and who am I responsible for if all this is true? Well, let me give you three things about how we find our God-given identity. I don't think it's an exhaustive list. But hopefully it will help you. Here's how. How do we find our God-given identity? Number one, by trusting the truth of who God is and who he says I am. Now, we immediately have a problem there because who God is is not necessarily who religion or even Christianity taught you that God is. 
Because if you have a God who is severe and picky and legalistic, you will never find who you really are because you'll spend all your time trying to please the God who can't be pleased because the moment you please him, you're proud. The moment you please him, you're full of yourself and you are justifying yourself. And so it becomes an unachievable target that says, this God wants everything from you, but you're never allowed to achieve everything because if you did, you wouldn't need him and he has to have you need him. That is not the God of Jesus. It is not the God of the Bible. It is not the right interpretation of who he is. So when I say we find our God-given identity by trusting the truth of who God is, some of you need to find who God really is. And we've been trying to help you with that to find who God really is and in the light of that to find who he says that you are you know what God says you are is not inadequate incapable a failure insecure lacking a loss he says one thing that's more important than anything in the universe he said you're mine and I call you my child. You are an inheriting son. You're an inheriting child. You are mine, which is why what God reserved to say to Jesus was not all the things that he should do and not do, what he should achieve and what he should avoid, but what he said to Jesus was, you're my son, I love you, I'm pleased with you. And Jesus saw God in a healthy role of father, not, not the beast, you know, pig of a person that some of you knew, but the kind of father you always wish you had. The God, the Jesus, the, the Abba of Jesus was, was the perfect father and more. And when you see God as that, you will see yourself differently. But the issue is, it comes the identity by trusting the truth of who God is. Do you trust the truth of who God is? Do you trust who he says that you are? Do you trust what he feels about you, even when you don't feel it about yourself? Because that's the difference. If you elevate what you feel about you above what God feels about you, you come into a place of hopelessness and helplessness. But I'm trying to help you to believe you have to trust the truth of who God is and who he says that I am. Number two, how do we find our God-given identity? By anchoring my life to someone or something outside of myself. You can't resolve this from just you. Because you're a mess, so you've only got mess to resolve the mess. Your mess has distorted your thinking, so you only have distorted thinking. Your mess has given you distorted love, so you only have distorted love as a model, right? Your mess has given you insecurity, so you only have an insecure view of God's answer. You can't solve it from there. You have to anchor your life to something and someone outside of yourself, which is you anchor that to who God says you are and who God really is and what he says about you. I anchor my life to that and to him. And as I do that in trust and faith, it means I begin to find my God-given identity because now I'm not judging myself. I have released the judgment on myself and I'm allowing God to make a difference in me and to be transformed by the renewing of my mind because I'm not thinking what I used to think about me, about my past, about my present, and about my future. And number three, how do we find our God-given identity? By trying to understand what it is that I am conforming to, which is taking me away from rather than towards who I truly am. You see, you've got to start to understand what it is you're conforming to. You're conforming to images and thoughts and expectations and desires and wounds and hurts. You're conforming to those things. If you will recognize that and understand that is what you are conforming to, which is taking you away from rather than towards who you truly are, then you'll be transformed by the renewing of your mind to start thinking some different things because you're no longer going to be conformed to the pattern that this world has said about you, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind to live in a more perfect and good will from God. So, here we go. In the formation of my true identity as a created being in a breakable world, it is more important to understand who I am to God and let that shape who he is to me so that out of that anchor point, I can know who I am to me. Jesus knew who he was to him after he knew who he was to the Father. Let me just repeat that before I close. It's more important to understand who I am to God 
See, the way religion will always take you is who is God to you? And all the pressure's on you. Because if you don't just see God right, worship God right, give him the right place, honor him in the right way, do all the things that he's asked, then you're guilty and you're condemned and you're judged. But you see, it's the other way around. It's more important to understand who I am to God and let that shape who he is to me. And believe me, when you truly understand who you are to God and that shapes who he is to you, out of that anchor point, you will know who you are to you. I'm a child of God. I'm a son of God. I'm loved. I'm accepted. I'm blessed. I'm favored. I'm part of the loving family that goes on forever and ever. Of all the inheritance that's come down through the ages that flows to my life. Because that's who I am. Not who I said I am. Not who the world said I am. But that's who I am. So I want you healed. I want your heart, your wounds, your mind, your thinking, your past, your memories to be healed. And so I want to pray a prayer tonight. So I just, let's just bow our heads just, just for one moment. If you're someone who's crying out for healing in this area, I'd like you just to stand where you are while we just, just pray. Just stand where you are. I want to pray a word of healing over you. All those thoughts, those things, those feelings, those, those wounds, those expectations, all, all that stuff that your mind has done, all, all that identity that's been constructed, as a defense mechanism to protect you that really needs to be broken so you can, you can blossom and break out to who God called you to be. I want to pray for you right now. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for who you are. And tonight we reach out to who you are. But we only reach out to you, you are, from the spirit of knowing who you think we are. Lord, tonight, I pray that every heart will get a grasp of who I am to you, who I am to you, who I am to you, to realize that in that environment, that flow of love that comes from you is a healing for this moment, healing for the past, healing for the wounds, and renewing of the mind, restoring of the heart, healing of the emotions flowing from you right now. So I release that in Jesus' name right now, Father. Renewing of the mind healing of the wounds, restoring of the heart, in Jesus' name. Let it flow by your grace into every life that's reaching out to you right now. Because of who you believe that we are, because of who you think we are, because of who you know us to be, and how you have owned us, I release it right now, Father, in this place, and pray for a cleansing flow just to work, to work through mind, spirit, soul, and body, to wash out the gunk and the junk and the garbage of the accumulation of years of nonsense and trying to discover who we are while chasing the wrong things. May it be washed away right now in the flow of your love and forgiveness in Jesus' name so that each one of us can say, I know who I am. God knows who I am and now I know who he is and in the light of that, I know who I am, and I'm a child of the beloved. I am, I am I'm a child of God. I'm an inheriting son. I'm, I'm more than a conqueror in the earth. I'm a king and a priest in this environment. Lord, I release it. May every heart receive it, because we are whole tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for watching. You can find out more about all the Rock is doing locally and internationally at www.rockofyork.co.uk. Then why not support The Rock from wherever you are? Just hit the donate button now to help us help others.